If software is eating the world, should you really start a software business? Hello and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Shea for the Sales Whisperer, your host. This is your home on the web for honest, no-hype insights, advice, and inspiration to help you sell more, faster, at higher margin with less stress and more fun. When I got out of the Air Force in 1997, I had a wife, a baby, another one on the way, and I had to put food on the table, which meant I had to be productive. I had to be efficient. I had to be successful at making sales. And I was. Over the next decade, I continued to succeed in various industries across the country, even across the world, which led me in 2006 to starting the Sales Whisperer. Since then, I have built a big business and a big family, and I have fed my family, provided for them based on my own skills, my hard work, my dedication, my insight. And now I give you this podcast as a free tool to help you learn what I have learned over 20 plus years. Another free tool that you can use to grow your sales is available over at thebestsalessecrets.com. Head on over there and it's over 21 pages of advice, things including the seven keys you need to apply to win at sales, how to look at money and the true purpose of the sale. So again, head on over to thebestsalessecrets.com for that free tool. And now on to the show. Hamid Shojai. How you like that, huh? I got it right the first time. It, it was perfect. All right. Founder and CEO of Pure Chat, uh, fellow entrepreneur, man after my own heart. Welcome to the sales podcast. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. You know, so founder and CEO, I mean, so, do, I, do I need to stand during this or can I like like sit down and kind of be at ease, you know? Yeah, um, I recommend standing. I mean, just because uh, that title is so impressive. I mean, <laughs> what does it take about uh, ten, fifteen dollar business license to be the founder and CEO, and then a lot of uh, sleepless nights? So <laughs> exactly, that's what people say. Well, who made you the sales whispers? Like, well, I'm, I made like eight hundred dollars to the USPTO, and they gave me the little circle R thingy. So you know, <laughs> get that's creative right. <laughs> and send some money to the government, and you too can be whomever you want to be, right? Exactly, exactly. Titles are easy to get. Uh, it's, it's the execution that's hard. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, all right. We're starting off with zingers. Very nice. Uh, so, but I mean, for those that don't know you, and this is my first time really corresponding with you, I, um, I know one of your fantastic employees that we'll talk about in a little bit. You stole her from one of my favorite companies, or should I say you attracted her? You, en- you enticed her with a better opportunity, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll dive in that a little bit, but I mean, for those that don't know you, would you mind take a minute or two, kind of tell everybody your background, you know, your history and, and we'll dive down the entrepreneurial rabbit hole. Um, sure, sure. So, uh, my background is basically, I'm a software guy. I, uh, have loved software and, uh, loved creating software for, uh, most of my adult uh, life, uh, for more than 20 years now. And uh, I've been involved in a number of uh, software startups, uh, which have included uh, uh, a couple of decent-sized successes, uh, most recently Axosoft, which uh, is a successful software company for uh, making developer tools, software development tools, actually. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and then the, um, the thing that I'm uh, hyper-focused on right now is a break-off of Axosoft called Pure Chat, which is a, a live chat uh, uh, sort of um, customer engagement tool uh, and lead capture tool for uh, for small businesses, uh, and uh, and that's been a lot of fun, and I've been focused on that for over a year now. Okay, uh, so how a lot of things to talk about? I mean, how do you start a software company? How do you decide to spin off a, a division of a software company? You know how? Because uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people. Um, that have an idea or maybe, maybe they don't, maybe they're just walking around frustrated, right? Oh, this is always so terrible. And it's like, isn't it possible they could start a software company and fix that issue? Even if they're not quote unquote, a software guy. It's definitely possible. It's just a lot more expensive. If you're not a software guy, I, I was uh, fortunate that I was a software guy. So I, I wrote the first uh, versions of my first few companies myself. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, success or failure. It's, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot less expensive because, uh, it's main, mainly that, uh, uh, time and, uh, um, sort of effort commitment that you put into it. If you can write the software yourself, right. um, if you have to, 
uh, hire people to do it, then it, uh, that's when it sort of becomes uh, super expensive uh, very, very quickly because there's a lot of information that gets lost in translation when you're communicating to some other soft, you know, to software engineers on what to build. Right. Uh, um, so they won't build exactly what you have in mind, and uh, and because they're gainfully employed, you know, like uh, it's not inexpensive to hire software engineers to build your idea. So, right. um, surprisingly, uh, you, you know, software is very very expensive business to get into, as opposed to most other businesses. Um, unless you're a software engineer, in which case, then the cost is a laptop, and you're you're good to go. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it's just yeah, you, so, huh? Right, right, and, uh, and and I think that's part of the reason why software engineering has, has become such a uh, interesting and uh, rapid growing uh, uh, sort of field, because so many people are realizing that uh, it's a it's a uh, great uh, business opportunity. Once you do actually make something that is useful and people use, it scales very very quickly um, with without a lot more cost. Uh, there's no cost of replication, for example, of your software, whether one person uses it or 1000, typically the cost is very close to the same. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of cool uh, benefits in having a software, uh, software business. Um, you know, I, I've heard guys talk about on other, other podcasts that, you know, identify a need, um, scope it out, kind of what you want, shop it out, right? Get a couple of guys overseas to bid on it. Um, get, get some initial person, somebody that identifies that need to pay for it and get a lifetime access to it. And you just go launch some software. Uh, they make it sound so, so simple. Uh, so are they kind of pulling the wool over our eyes? Well, the, the steps are pretty accurate that way you just described in, in that identifying a need, you know, sort of building uh, uh, prototypes of uh, what what you expect will sur- sort of sufficiently address that need. Um, then building it part is where it becomes interesting because uh, if you're having uh, outsource, uh, if you're outsourcing the building of the software, uh, then you're not building a software company uh, because someone else is building the software. Uh, and therefore, you're uh, likelihood of success as a software company is a lot less because uh, you uh, uh, it, it's not your expertise to as a company to be building the software if you're outsourcing that part of it and that's part of the most important part of it um, because what happens is almost uh, 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 you, you know almost universally everybody gets it wrong the first few iterations of software <laughs> um, and uh, and to you, you know, so you have to be able to rapidly, quick, and adapt and change things in order to get it right in version two or version three, and so on. Uh, which is why software is super famous for you know, like especially earlier versions of a product usually are famous for uh, not getting it right. But uh, when when it's outsourced, those version twos and version threes become. Uh, exponentially more expensive because, you know, maybe different people will be working on them. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there'll be a, a point of blame as to, well, you didn't give me the specs correctly. That's why the software was built <laughs> incorrectly. Or, uh, you know, oftentimes the outsourced people will get fired for a version two. So the, the costs become rapidly uh, out of control. Uh, most uh, software these don't succeed anyway, and the ones that outsource are even less likely to succeed. So uh, that makes it more challenging. But um, but the ones that do make it, though, uh, you know, they can they can build something that scales very quickly and can become a very successful uh, business faster than any uh, type of business in history was possible. Right. Um, so. Uh, software companies are the fastest growing companies in general. They're the only kind of company that you can go from zero to a billion dollar uh, 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 sort of uh, revenue in the shortest possible time. Right. Um, would you encourage entrepreneurs, I mean, people listening to this, to create a software component in their business? I mean, even if it's not their core, I mean, if they're a chiropractor, you know, if, you know, me, I'm a sales trainer, I, I do stuff with CRMs and email, you know, marketing automation. Uh, should I go out and either develop something or even, you know, a lot of people are always after me to white label their stuff, which is kind of right. tempting in a way. Uh, I mean, should I be more open to that? 
uh, or should I just stick to my core competency? That's a great question. I mean, the, 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 uh, my straight up answer would be that, uh, you probably shouldn't get into software unless, uh, uh unless there is sort of an itch there <laughs> that needs to be scratched. Either, uh, you are a software person or there's a, a, an immense amount of intrigue and interest in building a software, uh, company. But what I can tell you is that, um, there was an article that Mark Andreessen, the, the guy who uh, started Netscape and created Mo uh, Mozilla, the first sort of browser, or Netscape, uh, the first browser that, uh, uh, web browser that sort of uh, uh, kicked off the internet, if, uh, the, the World Wide Web, if you will. Uh, he wrote an article a while back called Software is Eating the World. And the, essentially the, um, the gist of the article was that everything is getting affected by software, um, whether uh, it's your car or your doctor or, you know, every industry basically is getting affected by software, um, restaurants, uh, everything. So, uh, so it, it is uh, super important to start like looking at your business from the perspective of, uh, can software eliminate the need for your business or you <laughs> personally? Right. So, um, you know, one way to look at it is that, uh, for example, if you're an Uber driver, uh, Uber's goal is to eliminate you <laughs> and and your your job essentially, right. uh, and software will affect you. So so there's things uh, to a perspective to have uh, that should include software, but that doesn't mean if you're an Uber driver you should go start a software company. But you should be thinking about okay, when self driving cars come out, uh, what are you going to be doing, and uh, and keeping that in mind. Well, but isn't that true of anything? You know, I, I'm watching um, that series Hell on Wheels uh, on AMC. You know, I've been watching it on Netflix, and they're they're talking about building the Transcontinental Railroad. You know, and and they just had they just threw a ton of men at it, right? And they're just they're they're chopping away at, at mountains and digging tunnels by hand, and um, and the lead character gets the steam shovel. You know, and you know, guys are like. Well, now what are we going to do? And one of the episodes, you know, three guys that were supervising or doing something, they were put out of a job. You know, so, I mean, doesn't technology in general, uh, whether it's software or whether it's hardware, even, you know, robotics, um, it, it eliminates jobs. I mean, it's just progress, isn't it? And, and creates other ones. And, and that's your point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it sucks to be the one, that, <laughs> one whose job is, uh, uh, is eliminated at the time, right? So, uh, being mindful of it, I think is, is important. Um, you know, sort of going back to your question of, should you be, you know, looking to start a software company if you are a chiropractor? Uh, no, uh, but, uh, you should probably think about ways that software might affect you. And, uh, and I, and I think that's the sort of key point that I'm making and not that, you know, um, uh, there won't be something else for those millions of people to do when their jobs are, are potentially eliminated by software, but but that um, their jobs will be affected in some way. And keeping that in mind, especially if you're in business, making sure your business is not what gets eliminated is is a very very uh, important uh, aspect of uh, uh, thinking about the software community in general. Well, so and I realize, I mean, it's kind of an extreme example of you know, a chiropractor making software, but I mean, you see it all the time. Somebody in an industry sees that, um, what'd you say earlier, either there's an itch or, or some type of huge need or, or, or interest. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if somebody is interested in their career or their industry, uh, it's going to lead them to expand, right. Or improve it somehow. And I mean, creating software seems like a cool way. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, but, and, should, but should they find someone like you and, and partner with you and say, Hey, I have this idea, you know, here's the potential, you know, do you want a piece of it? Or, you know, then you run into the whole partnership thing. Oh my gosh. And I've been burned more <laughs> times with partners than I've been successful. So that's kind of scary too. Yeah. No, uh, that, that's, uh, that's exactly right. And, and, and uh, so if the, the person's expertise uh, is not software, it's always, I think, a good idea to find, uh, find a co-founder uh, whose expertise is uh, in, in software if they're going to get into the software business. And, um, 
uh, and to make sure that they're both on the same page in terms of you know the future and, and vision of the company. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's uh, chiropractors, doctors, not not too far away from each other, but uh, there's a company that I recently uh, visited with um, who's building a uh, software for uh, doctors to be able to see their patients electronically using their mobile uh, devices, right? right. Uh, but it's founded by uh, some doctors, and uh, and uh, uh, they have gotten the technology people on board to be able to help build that uh, software company. Uh, but essentially is augmenting th- that type of a business for uh, doctor's offices. So their customers are going to be doctor's offices. Uh, right. And uh, the idea is that, you know, they'll, um, the doctor's patients will want to see them uh, electronically on their mobile phones and be able to diagnose like half of the uh, t- typical types of visits without having to actually step into the doctor's office. Yeah. Um, now, with, with respect to, you know, finding somebody to partner with, uh, I think uh, that increases the probability of success, despite the fact that it complicates things. Partnerships are always complicated, but uh, if you were to look at some of the most uh, successful companies in the world today, uh, they generally started with uh, with a couple of founders, uh, even if they were uh, of the same uh, uh, in the same field. Uh, largely because you can brainstorm with someone early on and uh, and be able to sort of. Uh, uh, iterate through ideas and uh, success and failures more quickly. So right. um, it's not all bad having a partner necessarily. <laughs> yeah, and I did. I just see something very recently talked about. You know, more the the most successful companies. Uh, what they have in common is they usually were founded by at least two people. You know, not just one guy. You know, strength. You know, cult of personality. It was it was two or more coming together and really building something up. Right. That's exactly correct. Um, so who's your partner? I was looking at AxoSoft. Looks like is that your wife? That's um, that's the boss of AxoSoft. Uh, uh, she is. Yeah, she's running AxoSoft now. Um, I, I, I would say that um, uh, AxoSoft ended up uh, getting started uh, without a partner. Uh, my wife has been super helpful. Uh, was was I should say super helpful in the earlier stages, uh, just as a sort of sounding board. Uh, but she wasn't active in the business. She became active later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but in lots of ways, I feel like, uh, you know, Axisoft suffered for not having a co-founder. Um, and, and it's not that you cannot do it, right? Like there's tons of examples of successes where it's just a single founder. Uh, but, but uh, you know, having a co-founder, I think, helps in some ways. And uh, there's uh, definite benefits and drawbacks. Uh, but part of the benefits is that, you know, like, most of the uber successful companies, the ridiculously successful ones that have uh, become multi-billion dollars are oftentimes with uh, uh, with a couple of uh, co-founders. Uh, so, all right, so going back to like the, a white label sort of thing, and, and this may be hard for you to answer because you're kind of biased because you develop stuff, right? You're like, I ain't going to white label, I'll just make it. Uh, but for somebody <laughs> like me who's not going to make it, you know, I may make stuff later on. I don't know. But, I mean, what, what would your recommendation be to somebody uh, like me? I mean, I, I'm, I understand software. I'm not a developer. Uh, I can open, lift the hood and tinker a little bit. Uh, but I'm not a programmer. I'm not a developer. I don't want to be doing customer support. Um, should I look at, at white labeling to, to expand you know, and improve my margins versus being a, a reseller or a certified partner of, of some software. So, so the uh, example that you use is essentially like you, you have an audience and a, a base of people that, um, that know you and know your expertise and so on. And, and does it make sense for you to um, sell other people's software products as your own by white labeling them, right? Is that, that's sort of the question that you're asking. Correct, because um, uh, and, like, like and CRM, my, my you know, yes. that, that some some will pay me uh, a certain percentage uh, to be just an affiliate or a partner, but others right. have double or triple or quadruple the margin if I if I wholesale it from them, right? And basically, white label it. Right. So my recommendation, and I, and I'll give you a, a few sort of uh, examples. My recommendation is that. Uh, remember how important your brand is. Uh, and if you are willing to commit to that business and you believe in something like that, then white labeling might be sort of the, the way to go. 
Um, otherwise, uh, affiliates uh, would be a great way to sort of uh, still capitalize on that audience, but um, but you know, recommending only things that you believe in, but you don't want to necessarily put your entire brand behind. Right. Uh, now, an example of a huge success uh, that has done the whole white labeling, if if you will, is. Uh, the Beats by Dr. Dre company, right? It's not that Dr. Dre knows anything about, you know, uh, the electronics or hardware that goes into that. Uh, but he essentially uh, became a massive owner of a company uh, who used him and his name uh, uh, to successfully market uh, good products. Um, but he was wholeheartedly behind it. And uh, there, there's no question that, uh, you, you know, like you, if you're going to make a commitment and white label something, uh, you do it in such a way that, uh, uh, that you know, makes sure that your name doesn't, uh, uh, your brand doesn't get sort of uh, ruined. Um, now, affiliate is a sort of uh, a, a easy way to do that without that commitment because you can say, here's a link to, uh, pure chat as an example. And, uh, if somebody signs up, uh, you still get, uh, in, in our case, we give our affiliates 25% of the, uh, purchase price. It's pretty much up and up. Uh, we still own the customer, uh, and we continue to pay that 25% as long as the customer remains a customer. You don't have to do anything other than, uh, just that initial, uh, uh, referral. Right. Um, so it, I would definitely take that into consideration determining between affiliate or white labeling. So you, you've got an idea and you've started your company. So we let's, let's forget for a moment that it's software. Um, okay. because now you just, you have a business, right? And how do you grow? How, how do you know, how do you know when to move out of your basement, right? Or out of your home office? Who's the first person you hire? Uh, and how do you know that they're right? Yeah. <laughs> Great questions. So, um, uh, the 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 answer to to those questions uh, uh, comes from traction, right? So if you have been able to start uh, your company uh, and from home or where, wherever, um, that means you uh, are already selling a product or a service. Um, and if you're starting to get traction, uh, that means there's people who are using your product or service and loving it. And what what um, is happening is that the idea is that. Uh, the number of customers is increasing for your product and service. Um, and if you see that trajectory uh, going in the right direction, you can sort of project what's going to happen in the future and start determining what you need. And what you might need is more people to help execute. Uh, if, uh, if you're in a uh, uh, sort of services type of business, then you're going to need uh, for every new dollar, there might be, you know, X number of, uh, dollars or cents rather spent on the people to execute on it. So you have to sort of plan out that, um, uh, labor requirement there. Uh, but one of the earliest hires that is super helpful is somebody to take on the administrative tasks, the accounting, the, uh, the, the stuff that most entrepreneurs absolutely don't want to be spending their time on. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately that type of, uh, uh, person is, uh, it, it needs to be skilled, but is not as expensive as uh, s sort of super knowledgeable about the type of business that uh, that that you're probably starting. So, um, so they don't have to have as much experience as you in order to execute on on those aspects of it. And then it frees up your time to be able to sell more or to write more code if you're doing software or to do whatever it is that you're you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, but like you said, you know, you're quote unquote, a software guy, uh, right. and which is a typical entrepreneur, you know, somebody is a car guy, a computer guy, you know, I mean, good at whatever, a good at chiropractic. Uh, but then you've got to make money, right? How do you make that transition or how do you blend the two? How do you, how do you bring on? Cause most people that I have ever spoken to and all I've ever done for 20 years is sell. Uh, and most people, even salespeople, are afraid of money. They're afraid to ask for the order. They're afraid to, to haggle and negotiate. Uh, but now, you know, you're a coder, you're a developer, right? If, if I had to pigeonhole you, you know, I picture you in, in a, uh, some type of logo T-shirt um, in, in a very dark room, uh, haven't seen the sunlight in probably months, 
a uh, bunch of crushed, empty, you know, monster and Red Bull cans all over the place, empty pizza <laughs> boxes, you know, and now, so you got this great code, but you're like, hey, I need to charge some money for this. Oh, hell, I, I don't want to do that. It's like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, right? Wozniak wanted to give it away. You right. Know? And Jobs is like, right, right. you're a fool. We're selling this for a <laughs> lot of money, you know? So how, how, do you, how does that entrepreneur make that transition and say, a, I'm going to charge for this, and B, I'm going to charge a lot of money for it. Right. Uh, yeah. No. That that that's a great uh, that's a great question. Um, and first of all, if you if you're the Wozniak, uh, that's uh, even more important. Why you should have a partner, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but <laughs> but uh, uh, but so I'm a software guy. I'll I'll give you my perspective on it. Um, software is free to replicate. Uh, so yeah. if you build a software product, you can put it out on the internet. Millions of people could potentially use it for free, and it wouldn't cost you a dime. Right. Uh, if it's in a, a if it's a sort of a hosted type of solution, it might cost you a little bit, but generally speaking, the costs are relatively small compared to labor costs, for example. Right. Uh, so they're almost negligible. Um, so uh, one of the uh, one of the ways that I have built my software companies uh, and uh, various different software products, and you know you. Um, Going back to a very early question that you asked that I haven't answered yet, which is, you know, how did we decide to break Pure Chat into its own company? Mm -hmm. Is that I've put out my software products out there for free for people to use, uh, and then if it gets traction, uh, that's when uh, that's when I, uh, you know, like continue to invest in it and um, improve the product, and then eventually uh, charge something for it. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, in, so in the software business, you don't actually have to have salespeople. You don't even have to talk to anyone in order to sell something, uh, which is a very unique type of uh, uh, business to have, right? where, where somebody who, um, you know, that uh, person you described with the dark, working in a dark room with the monster cans and so on, could actually have a multi-million dollar business without ever actually speaking to another human being. Right. Um, so the software actually makes that possible uh, by doing that. Now, in in other types of businesses, I think uh, you know eventually you have to be you know, get comfortable with uh, with sales. And even in software, for some types of software businesses, you have to uh, be there uh, talking to customers, making uh, doing demos, and you know giving presentations. Eventually, you have to support those customers. So. Um, you know, hiring becomes important in making sure that uh, you're building your company in the way that uh, that you want it to be. So, all right. Now that kind of intrigues me. So you talk about putting putting your software out there for free until it gets traction. So, then is this basically a side job, right? Or you know, a side project? You know, you got a day job somewhere. And like I'm gonna see if this works. You know, because what happens if it doesn't? You know, because it. Right. It may take you weeks or, I don't know, months of coding, right, to even have a, a 1.0 or a, or a 0 0.5 version that you can even give away for free. Uh, yep. And, and I, that, again, may take months or more, a year, before you truly do have traction. Um, yes. So, I mean, are you just, you know, is it a side job until it works or are you living on, you know, savings and hoping that it works or do you bring in investors, angel investors, you know, I mean, there's all, a lot of, of the, things going all, on there. All of the above are possible, right? So it, you, you absolutely nailed it. And, uh, and yes, that, that's exactly correct. Uh, oftentimes, software takes years to develop uh, the first, uh, you know, like working versions that might eventually get traction. My perspective has been that uh, if I can get it to have traction for free, uh, then, uh, then eventually I can make it good enough for people to be willing to pay for it. Uh, but if you... Uh, if you start out with uh, software and ha go after a paid model from the get-go, which is what a lot of uh, people do, uh, and it doesn't get traction, uh, uh, it, the, you, you know, it's a lot less likely to get traction as a paid product than as a free product. Because if something doesn't get traction as free, then you know nobody would have been willing to pay for it. <laughs> so, right. So, you, you know, you have that... Uh, uh, you can sort of set the bar super low and see whether or not the product can get traction. Now, uh, as far as how do you fund the development of the software for the six months, year or two years or whatever it is that uh, uh, you're working to build it, 
uh, yeah, if it's just you, it might be a side project. If it's, uh, if it's a team of people, you're going to need to get funding for it. Um, with pure chat, when we separated it out, um, we were already, uh, two years in development. Uh, we had tons of traction, but the traction was all while the product was free. And we decided that we still have a lot of work to do before we try to optimize it for revenue. Uh, so we went out there and raised one and a half million dollars of angel money. Uh, to sort of get it to the next stage. Uh, and even today, it's, uh, it's still um, in investment phase, which, is, uh, which means basically we're losing money every month <laughs> because we're investing more in its development than we are uh, in its revenue right. uh, or getting money from its revenue. So, um, so yeah, software is a sort of a, a super expensive business to build. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, I think that's something that doesn't necessarily come across very easily uh, or, or instinctively. So is raising money, is it, is it like Shark Tank? Do, does somebody look at you and say, you're dead to me? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think Shark Tank is about as uh, different as uh, it can possibly be from the reality of raising money because uh, <laughs> it's rare that you're going up in front of uh, you know three or four uh, made for TV a holes. <laughs> okay, Hamid, I'll give you 1.5 million dollars. Uh, I want I want 87 percent, and I want. Uh, Three dollars per new client per month in that's perpetuity. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, no, uh, but but you know, raising money definitely is not easy, and uh, but uh, and it's it's very interesting. In in my case, I've done it when I was um, uh, twenty years old uh, or twenty two years old with absolutely no experience in my first software uh, startup. Uh, and that was a very interesting thing about 20 years ago that I went through. Uh, and then uh, that eventually that failed and I left and I uh, started my next company without investment and swore, swore off that I'll never take investment again because they sort of steer you wrong. Um, and then uh, fast forward uh, to the latest uh, uh, sort of thing that I'm doing with Pure Chat. And when we broke Pure Chat off uh, from Axosoft, I decided to go ahead and go raise money and uh, – Uh, get investment for it. So um, I went from like swearing off investment uh, investors, you know, uh, 19, 20 years ago to actually uh, going after it again. And it was a very interesting experience uh, from my early 20s in that uh, it was harder than I remembered it being, (laughs) for sure. Um, People didn't just want to write checks, uh, despite the experience and despite the traction the product had and uh, despite a lot of good things that, you know, I thought we had going for pure chat that should have made it a no brainer investment. Um, but, uh, but also, uh, you, you know, we were sort of successful in, in raising one and a half million, which is pretty rare for companies to do these days, especially in Arizona. So, um, so, so there was some uh, uh, validation for our efforts, if you will. Um, so let's talk about pure chat. I mean, what's, how did this come about? I mean, there's a lot of chat software out there. Uh, how did you know that you had something, uh, that could compete, uh, with with what was out there and and what type of ROI are you seeing people, uh, have by having this uh, immediate chat option on their sites? Um, so uh, one of the things that we do at Axosoft every year is uh, take um, 30 days off, uh, have the development team th- take 30 days off and work on uh, the latest and greatest new t- uh, sort of development technologies to keep their skills sharp and make sure everybody's on the sort of cutting edge of technology. Because software development tools and technologies change so rapidly that Uh, It's very hard if you're working in the same thing to know what's going on around you if you don't come up for a breath every now and then. So our way of addressing that problem was to, uh, on an annual basis, to have the whole team take 30 days off and work on sort of side projects, if you will, and uh, just new projects from scratch. Uh, And PureChat was born from one of those 30-day projects years ago. Wow. Uh, actually, originally in like 2008, but uh, that version of the, the product uh, sort of didn't go anywhere. And we eventually, uh, uh, I mean, it, it sort of died as a side project and not much attention was paid to it. Uh, but then again, in 2012, 
um, the, there was a, a group of people who wanted to use some cool web technologies and web sockets and node and like various different technologies that they didn't get to use on a day to day basis um, to build a, a better version of uh, live chat tools than what already exists out there because uh, uh, this stuff was just a little bit complicated and uh, a little bit cumbersome. The user experience wasn't fantastic, if you will, uh, of live chat tools uh, historically. So, so that's what they did. They uh, built something in 30 days, uh, and we put it out there uh, on the Internet for other people to use freely, as we did with a lot of our 30-day projects, by the way. Uh, and most of our 30-day projects would die after the 30 days because, you, you know, like uh, they weren't fully baked products or, um, you know, they weren't products that we were uh, putting investment behind on a continued basis. Uh, but with Pure Chat, what we saw happening is that uh, uh, several companies started using it. And then uh, weeks later, even more people were using it. And uh, a few months la later, we looked at the numbers and we're like, wow, the growth rate here is pretty uh, pretty interesting. There, you, know, you know, it had gone from like three or four signups per day to like 15 to 20 signups per day. And that didn't happen normally from uh, for our side projects. Um, so what happened is we decided, OK, let's put a, a dedicated person to continue to enhance the product and let's see what happens uh, we'll come back to it in a few months and, and see what happens. And what we saw is the numbers just kept going up, and it was like 40 and 50 signups a day, and then 100 and 200 and 300. So eventually we decided, okay, you know what, we should uh, – uh, now we have like six people dedicated to this thing last year, um, and uh, we're making a pretty substantial investment on an ongoing basis in, in uh, the cost of development. So we think that we have a, a business here that uh, – uh, has a uh, good uh, foundation and very like high likelihood of success out there. So we decided to separate it out into its own company uh, and uh, do the raise and sort of funding around it. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. So that's how sort of Pure Chat came to be. So tell me again on this this thirty day. How often would y'all take thirty days off and work on side projects? <laughs> Yeah, once a year. So 30 days, one month essentially is uh, is about 8.5% of uh, uh, a person's time per year, right? right. The development team's time. Uh, Google has something they call the 20% time. I don't know if yep. uh, you've heard of that. Yep, but I've heard of that. It's basically where Google software engineers get to uh, spend 20% of their time doing something else, but they sort of do it individually, whereas we do it as a team and it's just under 10% of our time. And, uh, um, and it actually ends up yielding some interesting products and cool stuff have come out of it. So does the whole team, do y'all kind of like take a vote like, Hey, we're going to work on project a, uh, on this or. Yeah. So, okay. so we've done it in a variety of different ways. We've done it where like everybody does their own thing and, and people can pick whatever they want. We've done it where we've had themes of, you know, like, all right, let, let's get into uh, groups of two and have uh, sort of mini projects uh, where the team of two gets to pick. And um, we've had it where people can pitch any idea that they want and uh, the teams can sort of pick them. Uh, and then we've had it to where... Um, uh, we break up into uh, two teams specifically and just uh, build a product and a company and websites and everything around it in 30 days. And those are the ones that have been the most fun and have ended up sort of resulting in something that was more interesting. Pure Chat was the result of one of those. Cool. So what, what type of success are you seeing people have with, uh, with Pure Chat? Oh, um, so yeah, uh, the, the reason that the product has gotten so much traction is because when you add live chat to your website, what, what you're essentially doing, if you're, if you're selling something online, uh, is you're bringing that personal connection back to uh, your store or your presence online. Um, and that personal connection, basically what it does is it increases conversions. It increases the likelihood that someone will purchase something from you because they get their questions answered. Um, so, uh, you, you know, we compare it to like if, if you had a retail store, if you, if you uh, had a shop at a mall uh, and you didn't have any attendance at that shop uh, and everything was self-service, uh, yeah, it would have X dollars in sales, that store. 
Uh, but if it had attendance at it, where the attendance could actually sh- answer questions and say, you know, if somebody was like, hey, what's the price of this? Or can I buy this and this together? Or, you know, what's your return policy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the likelihood that people would be uh, making those transactions goes up substantially. So the attendant based store would actually have more sales. And that's exactly what Pure Chat does is it brings that attendant in real time to be able to answer questions. And uh, and the, it, just to be clear, it's the, still the business that's answering the questions. It's the person who knows the details, ins and outs of the business. Right. We're not uh, answering the questions. We're just providing the software. Um, and it's super easy to do. Like we've made it so that it's uh, you're up and running in under three minutes. You can get Pure Chat on your website. Uh, and as people come to your site, uh, they can have a conversation with you. And uh, uh, the ROI on it is off the charts because people pay us as little as, uh, first of all, nothing. There's free plans. Uh, but even the paid plans start at just $5 per user per month. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, m- many of our customers swear they have like thousands of dollars per sale and sometimes the first day of using our product. Right. Uh, so yeah. the return on investment is off the charts. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah. what do you foresee uh, with Pure Chat? I mean, you're still an investor uh, funded. Um, when do you see uh, breaking even? Um, so uh, w- our growth trajectory has been super uh, awesome. And uh, uh, we, we think that there's a lot of uh, cool stuff that we can do. Um, if we had to break even, uh, we could do it fairly rapidly within just a, a handful of uh, months. We could uh, we could sort of make the company profitable if we had to. Okay. Um, but because of the opportunities that we see out there, we think it's uh, – Smart for us to continue investing in it and really going after uh, just uh, the slew of things that small businesses need with respect to lead capture and that conversion of those leads into actual sales. Right. Um, so we're excited about the stuff that uh, that we have in the works, and uh, y- you know we're we're not as hyper focused on. Um, making the company profitable in the immediate short term. Right. Uh, we're very much focused on the growth of the company in the, in the short term. And, uh, and we're uh, comfortable. We're going to, we, we have enough funding that, uh, uh, we'll be able to make it profitable when the time is right. Got gotcha. you. Gotcha. So, yeah. it's, so it's kind of like you, uh, you start out making hamburgers and then you realize, Hey, we could make, shakes and oh wow we could also make i don't know chicken burgers right so you you <laughs> wherever the demand is you keep filling that and and shoring up the base um uh, until when you when you, you, when you use a bur- burger a- a- analogy one of my f- favorite burger places is in and out sure. and uh and i love in and out's model because one of the things that they've done really well is stick to just burgers right right um so uh, I'm not sure uh, if uh, if ours would be the equivalent of adding chicken sandwiches as it would be to add like animal style and protein style. Nah. <laughs> and that's but, all but, yeah. the menu stuff. People don't all they don't all know the animal style. That's uh, you got to be in the know. That's right. That's right. We have actually <laughs> features that we don't advertise on our website uh, that uh, end up uh, being some cool stuff. Kind of off the menu stuff. Very nice. Um, well, where can people find you or your company? Where should we send them to, to learn more and interact with you? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, pure chat is just pure chat.com. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, people can sign up for a free account, of course. And, um, and, uh, uh, for, as far as me goes, I have a Twitter account, uh, at Hamid S it's spelled H A M I D S. Um, you can uh, write me on Twitter. Uh, my uh, email address is Hamid at uh, purechat.com, so people can email me that way. Uh, and I have a website that I don't maintain very well uh, at <laughs> hamidshojai.com, but <laughs> uh, it's my first and last name, uh, .com. So, right. Uh, all right. We will have all of those uh, in the show notes as well. Well, uh, very Thanks for taking time on a Friday to hang out with me. Um, I will, uh, I'll be out in Scottsdale in a month or so, and uh, I'll swing by and say hello and 
Um, that would sure, be fantastic. Uh, make yeah, sure we, Lindsay's we working hard. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> Work her to death. Her. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that that would not be good. But uh, we, we love uh, we love her. She's she's been transformational since she's been uh, uh, since she's joined the team. So uh, we're super excited to have her actually. Um, All right. And, and uh, yeah, we would love to see you in Scottsdale. Thank you very much for having me on your show. All right. It's been I a pleasure. It. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. All right. You too. Software is eating the world. What a line, huh? So here's a software guy telling you don't do software. But if you do do software, do it right. Uh, know what to outsource. And you know what? That's just so true of any business. I see it all the time. And I tell business owners all the time that your number one job is to market your business. You can't outsource that. Sure, you can bring people like me in to augment it, to consult, uh, to maybe jumpstart, right, or overview, proofread, springboard, whatever idea you want. But you have to own your marketing. It's your story. You know why you started your business. You know why you're in business. You know why your customers come to you. You can't outsource that. You own that, and you should own that. That's what makes you different. Okay, you understand the should ask questions, you know, the questions that should be asked, but the customer doesn't even know that they should ask them. That's where you separate yourself. That's where you differentiate yourself. Okay, uh, I love what he talked about how you, the most successful companies were started by at least two founders, you know, and I have struggled with that over the years. I have looked for people, tried to partner with people, and maybe they, I'm still got to kiss a few more frogs. I don't know. It's not that I want to give things away you know, or give a big part of my business away. Uh, but I do understand that I work better bouncing ideas off of each other, sharing ideas, propping each other up, motivating each other, looking at things from different angles. Uh, so that's, that was an interesting statistic and in fact that he brought up. Uh, so maybe you need to apply that same thing in your own business. Okay. Uh, but I think that really the, the key thing there, uh, is outsource the mundane so you can focus on what's really important. Uh, but being in software now for many, many years, uh, I can tell you that the margins are crazy high, which can be a great thing, but you better make sure you've got a good team that you, you're solving a big problem, uh, because you have to care and water and feed and nurture and update and patch that thing all the time, okay? Just because you've made one piece of code that solved the problem doesn't mean it will not be a problem for you forever, you know? So like they say, the, the grass may be greener, but you still got to water it. That'll do it for today's show, but the learning and the doing now follows. If you would like my help to implement what needs to get done, help you identify what needs to get done and the best path and the best vehicles to use to accelerate down that path, please head on over to the saleswhisperer.com slash IPA. There you will see an overview of what I call my initial process assessment. It's not expensive, but it's not cheap. Uh, but you know, like they say, I'd rather spend more than I wanted to than less than I should to grow my business. So if you need some help, if you'd like me one-on-one -on -one to help, again, please head on over to thesaleswhisperer.com slash IPA. And as always, remember to sell different. <laughs>